the first thing I want to do is um, welcome some folks that are back with us today. And uh, we have a new person with us today, Amira. And uh, we're so happy to have you with us. So just, uh, I always like to repeat this over and over and over again. Uh, the Islamic Society Leading American Muslims is an organization that conducts da'wah. And right now we have done over 200 speeches this year. At this point, what we know of is a thousand and three Qurans have been given away. And um, our culture and our mission is to educate and empower people who come to Islam. Whether they were born in Islam and they're returning or whether they are reverts. Uh, but it's to empower and nurture them and to create a family. So um, the Islam family is non-castigating, non-judgmental, non-critical, non-indicting. And if anybody does that, I'd like to know about it. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome. Oh, so nice to meet you. Come in, come in. There's coffee if you'd like to get coffee. We're just getting started. In the, yes. And other things besides coffee. So if, um, please, my beloved brother and sister, introduce yourself so that everybody can um, know who you are. They used to be with us and they moved out west. Oh, us? Yes. Hamza, oh. uh, I'm still here in Orlando, but uh, every time I come back to Orlando, I come to visit. Uh, I'm to be here. Mashallah. And she worked till 7.30 this morning. Well, may Allah sure? bless you exceedingly abundantly <laughs> above. <laughs> and, and of course, please, will you introduce yourself again because some people were getting coffee. Okay, sure. So uh, my name is Yusuf. I'm coming here from Atlanta. We're visiting my mom and my dad and our family. Uh, we're coming from Atlanta. Alhamdulillah. Welcome. And that's his wife, Noor. Yes. And we have Noor and Noor Ann. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, alhamdulillah. So I think you guys missed that, but the culture of Islamic is um, non judgmental, non castigating, non critical, non indicting. And if anyone does that to you while you're here, I'll beat them up in the parking lot. Not really, but we just don't like that. We are trying to create a space that people can come wherever they are in their faith journey uh, or non faith journey um, and be safe from all of that. So, um, I think we might have a few more people, but I'll just go ahead and get started anyway. Any announcements, Naran, that I need to make? No. Um, well, we want to reestablish our potlucks in the mon uh, um, on the fourth Saturday of every month at St. Luke's, because we just got the um, room for every fourth Saturday. So try to set your calendars up for the fourth Saturday nights at 6.30, right? Six. Six? Yeah. Six. So we're going we're gonna to do the fourth Saturday of January. Sorry, I missed it. I, I yes, I okay. So try to go ahead and block your calendars because uh, we get together, everybody brings their favorite dish and we share, and we always have a halakha. Islamic Inc., Islam Inc. never meets without having a short uh, halakha of some kind. <laughs> Uh, because Allah loves the houses and the places where His name is being mentioned, inshaAllah. So, in Alhamdulillah Ta'ala, Nahmaduhu wa Nasta'inuhu wa Nastafru, wa Na'udhu Billahi min Shururi and Fusina, wa min Sayyati Amalina, wa may Yahdihilahu Fala Muddala, wa may Yudhila Fala Hadiya La, wa Ashadu An La Ilahi La, wa Dahu La Sharika La, wa Ashadu An Muhammad and Abduhu Rasulu. Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our soul and from our sinful deeds. Those who are guided by Allah, no one can misguide them. Those who are not guided by Allah, there is no guide for them. I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and messenger. O you who believe, revere Allah as you should be revered and die not except as Muslims. Ammabad. Today, I deem by Allah, we're on the 51st 
uh, Asma wa Safara of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we started this class so that people could really be introduced to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that with much prayer uh, we would begin to adopt those attributes in our life and try to manifest, realize and materialize those attributes in our daily life. So we'll return to this and the name that we're looking at today is Al-Haq. And of course I always show you the image in Arabic and um, this is referred to in English as the truth. And so we'll look at a lot of different things today and inshallah at the end of the class have some discussion about what we learned today. So here's some definitions. Um, the truth, the reality, the just and correct, the truly existing. Um, what we say is that anything that um, we say is the reality on this earth, it is really not the reality. It's just what you see with your physical eyes and you hear with your physical ears. Uh, because there are things that will disappear and we don't know that, that later they're going to disappear, but we will say the reality. The other interesting use of the word reality is when uh, married couples are having an argument and they say, well, the reality of the situation is, and it's not the reality of the situation at all because it's just that person's subjective reality. So when we are talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the reality and we'll look at why that's the case. The one who is the truth, the real, and the truly existing, the one whose essence is the only substance and the only reality, the one whose essence is wisdom, justice, right, righteous, rightness, the one who is just, right, proper, correct. The one whose essence is unavoidable. The one who acts in accord with the needs of every situation. The one through whom all righteousness, justice, and truth are revealed. From the root ha and ha. Oh, thank you. Just remind me if I forget to use this thing which has the following classical Arabic connotations to be suitable to the requirements of wisdom, justice, truth, or fact. And I just want to touch on this a minute because we have people that go to school for many, many years and they sometimes become judges. Can a judge be just if he's angry or she? No. Why? Their judgment will be clouded by their emotions right so only Allah has that capacity so it, we as parents and I'll, I'm, I'll humble myself here um, sometimes we think that we know what's best for our children when in fact later on 20 years later we say wow now if I knew what I knew today I would have done it this way but when we're doing it we think that it's absolutely the right thing to do and sometimes the children, so I can make this fair, uh, the children think that they absolutely know what's right and that parents don't know anything. And then when they get our age, they say, wow, mom and dad were right. So I just want to make sure I'm fair and not one-sided here. <laughs> All right, to be suitable to the requirements of wisdom, justice, truth, or fact, to be in accord with the needs of the situation. Uh, and this is amazing. Uh, Sheikh Taha, who was my teacher for three years, uh, an Iraqi scholar from Allah Sahar. I'm sorry, I, I miss him. He passed away about two years ago. And that void has just not been filled in my heart. Often we do the same thing with truth. And we will not see everything because our physical vision is limited. And we'll say the truth is that car was the one that hit the other car. But later when we have a camera, we find out that what we thought was truth was in fact not truth. And with the needs of the situation, Sheikh Taha always told me, Abdurrahman, when someone asks you a question, you ask them, is this your situation? Because many people have questions, 
but their situation is very important whenever you are giving nasiha. You must know the actual situation. To be true, right, correct, just, proper, to be genuine, authentic. And this is something that I, I want to touch on here because when people revert to Islam, people say to them, change your name, you got to change this, you got to change that, and they, become, they come to you with all of this rigidity. And what I say to them is there's nowhere in the religion that says you need to change your name. It's actually a bidda unless your name was the name of a god. And then I say to people, be authentically and organically who you are. Islam did not call people to transform them into some kind of template that other people have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed every single person in this room with unique characteristics. And there, every single person in this room can touch people that I may not be able to touch, and I may be able to touch people that you might not be able to touch. So I say to people, find out who you are at your core. As long as that's in alignment and harmony with the Quran and the Sunnah, don't try to change your actual core, your authentic, organic self. So to be true, right, correct, just, proper, to be genuine, authentic, real, sound, substantial. And here we look at sound and we often talk in Islam about sound knowledge. We talk about ahadith. Is that a sound ahadith? Or is it da'if? Is there doubt in that hadith? Is there some perhaps falsehood that has been fabricated into that hadith? Substantial to be established. Confirmed as fact, to be necessary, requisite, justified, to be unavoidable, inevitable, due, to be binding, obligatory, incumbent upon, to happen without doubt or uncertainty. And the name is used as a name nine times in the Quran, and it's actually the, the verb form, haq, is used in other places. But we are going to look at the nine places that it's actually used as al-haq. And so we can see that if we were to really try to emulate the essence of this asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we have a tall order here to be right. And not right according to our akal. And I think this is an important piece to add here. That when I am right, which, where am I getting my signals? I'm getting my signals from the ruh. So if the ruh doesn't have correct knowledge, then I can be misguided. So my signal must be coming from my ruh if my ruh, the intellect of my ruh is from Quran and Sunnah. If my signal is coming from my nafs, the nafs thinks it's equally right. Even the nafs will say I'm doing, I'm being fair. Knowing all the while that it's not being fair, that you're not being fair. You have your own personal agenda and your own personal interest at heart, but you will delude yourself, you will delude the brain to think that you're actually being fair or right. So anytime we differ in a matter or we aren't clear, where do we, what do we refer to? Allah and His Messenger. These are the nine places where... Um, Al-Haq are found, and in two places, there are twice in each. So um, some people might look and say, well, that's not nine, but you have to count the verses that it is found twice in. So we'll review these verses just so you'll have a taste of what you will see in the Holy Quran about these names. And so hopefully, as we go through the class today, you will contemplate, reflect, and ponder on the deeper meaning of this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Surah Al-An'am, and I just want to say to you how happy I am to be with my family today. It was wonderful to be in Boston in cold weather for a change, but I can't tell you how happy I am today to see your faces. MashaAllah. I very, feel very blessed to be with you today. So in Surah 6 verse 62, And they who have died are thereupon brought before God, their true Lord, whoops, that was definitely not what I wanted to do. There we are. Their true Lord Supreme. 
O oh, verily, Allah is alone in all judgment, and Allah is the swiftest of all reckoners. In Surah Yunus, verse 30 and 32, and for my reverts here, sometimes you will see this spelled Y-U-N-U-S, or transliterated Y-U-N-U-S. I think this one is more accurate of a transliteration. There are then will, sorry, there and then will every human being clearly apprehend what he or she has done in the past, and all will be brought back unto God, their Lord, their true Lord, supreme, and all their false imagery will have forsaken them. Well, where does the false imagery come in? Which signal gives false image, imagery? The occult. Because things are not always as we see them. If I am in a desert and I am about to die of thirst, what might I see? I might see a mirage and I will kill myself trying to get to that water that's not there. And I'm sure that many of you have examples of thinking that you saw something and you did not. I often think I see someone that's somebody else. And I'm wrong. And the older I get, the more often I'm wrong. But maybe we won't talk about that too much. <laughs> uh, here again in Surah Yunus, verse 32, seeing that Allah is God, your sustainer, the ultimate truth. For after the truth has been forsaken, what is there left but error? How then can you lose sight of the truth? And let's talk about the delusion of science. Now, I'm not disrespecting science because Islam celebrates all of the sciences. However, we're going to get different answers in here. How many planets were there when you were going to school? Anybody can tell me. How many planets are you guys taught? Now, they have just this week discovered another one, and guess what they're calling it? Far out. I'm serious. Check this out. Um, so many of us thought that we were right because that's what we learned in school. But in fact, that was a piece of information in the occult and it was wrong. We were also taught that the earth at one time, people were taught that the earth was flat and that if you kept walking, you would fall off. Then we were taught that the world was round. And now we are being taught that the world is, or that the earth is pear-shaped. So we all thought that they were telling us the truth. The only truth is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is infallible. It's, it's cannot, it's cannot be violated. But any kind of information up here, be wary of that. Now when it comes to the science of math, it can prove itself. It's pretty interesting. But be aware that there are problems that mathematicians cannot solve. Sometimes we don't think about that. Surah Taha, verse 114, Know then that Allah is sub sublimely exalted, the ultimate sovereign, the ultimate truth. And knowing this, do not approach the Quran in haste, ere it has been revealed unto thee in full, but always say, O oh, my sustainer, cause me to grow in knowledge. Knowledge of what? What is the context of the verse? The knowledge of truth. And this is really problematic for reverts because we have Sheikh Yahoo and Sheikh Google out there. And so many people become Muslims and they say, Alhamdulillah, I will learn my Islam on the computer. And then they get misled. Because what is being promoted as a truth, in fact, is not a truth. And unfortunately, and it might become a surprise to some of you, there are now over 200 sects of Islam that we know about, that are pretty generally known about. Yes. And they all have different truths, but they're not the truth. And this is how we really have to understand our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should be praying for the truth. We should be praying for accurate knowledge. 
In Surah Al-Hajj, verse 6, all this happens because God alone is the ultimate truth and because Allah alone brings the dead to life and because Allah has the power to will anything. In verse 62 of Surah Al-Hajj, thus it is because God alone is the ultimate truth so that all that men and women invoke besides Allah is sheer falsehood and because Allah alone is exalted great. So here we know and we're being told that if you invoke any other deity besides Allah, you are not in truth. You are in falsehood. And this is also one of the risk of biblical studies because the Bible has been translated so many times and we do not have any originals. So imagine trying to study something that's been translated so many times and there's no original copy of it and then you will say that you have the truth what a delusion and then for people like me who struggle with arabic then i must really really go to people to make sure that i have the truth so the ultimate and this is why it is so important and i encourage you to learn arabic I encourage you to be able to understand the trilateral root, to understand what tense you're looking at because the Quranic verses come to life like you've never seen when you recognize the tense that that ayat is in. Whether it's commanding you to do something, whether it is talking about the present, or whether it is talking about the future. In Surah An-Nur, Verse 25, on, the, on that day will God pay them in full for their just due? Yes. Maybe I should hand this to somebody else. <laughs> and they will come to know that God alone is the ultimate truth, manifest and manifesting the true nature of all that has ever been done. And it's interesting because as a therapist, most people do not know themselves. They do not know the truth about themselves. Most of us are deluded. We actually think we're somebody that we're not. And uh, particularly when I, in some of the places that I've worked, people really don't know their self. And what do we know the teaching of Islam is? To know yourself is to know Allah. To know yourself is to know Allah. So we should be studying to know the truth about who we really are. Yeah, well, that's what they say, but that's not what the Messenger of Allah says. So there, see how we can be deluded by these cliches even. They sound really good. Fake it till you make it. And there could even be some truth in that. When I'm first telling people in therapy, tell me that you love yourself. Because no one truly believes until they love for their neighbor what they love for themselves so you can't give more love than you have for yourself <clears throat> and then they say but I don't know and how often are we asked questions about ourself and we say I don't know so I don't allow people to say that in my office no one is allowed to say I don't know because we do know we just don't like to look at it because it's so painful the so-called truth is sometimes very painful In Surah Luqman, verse 30, Revere thy parents, yet should they endeavor to make thee ascribe divinity side by side with me to something which thy mind cannot accept as divine. Obey them not, but even then, bear them company in this world's life with kindness and follow the path of those who turn towards me. In the end unto me, you all must return and thereupon I shall make you truly understand all that you were doing in life. So all of the things that we don't understand in this life, we do not know about them. Well, there will be a day when we'll be able to know about them. In Surah 17, verse 81, and say the truth is now come to light. We, the truth enlightens us and falsehood has withered away. For behold, all falsehood is bound to wither away. And so, from one of the great classic books about the Asma wa Safat of Allah, 
We're going to look at some reflections from the great names of Allah by El Sayyid, Rashad, and um, insha'Allah from these you will gain great benefit. One of the most beautiful and glorious of all Allah's names is Al Haq, the truth, whose existence is proven true, and so is Allah's divinity. Allah is the one who makes the truth manifest by the power of Allah's words. Now, let me touch on this because the kalam of Allah is actually a shafa for us. It's a healing for us. So that when people are sick, what we used to do um, is we had these uh, little um, portable, portable but I kept MP3 players. And we would put the Quran in their ear. Now, I deem by Allah, twice in my life I've been told I was going to die. This was the truth to those doctors, that I am going to die. And I listened to the kalam of Allah, the speech of Allah, the truth. And even though I could not understand it, all of it, I believe that it healed me, because the truth heals. Who supports those whom Allah loves by Allah's signs, Allah is the truth, Al-Haq, who is worthy of being adored, who is always there and who never disappears, whose presence is proven to have always been since time immemorial. And forever, nay, even before time and above time is Allah, for Allah's presence is a reality standing on its own merits. And there is no existence except through Allah and by Allah, and Allah is the fixed, who never moves, who is above motion or anything physical or material. And when we really break this down, and I would love to take any of these names and attributes and have like a book club, but we just look at the names and attributes and actually really ponder and reflect on each part of every sentence here. Because it is so deep and it is so profound, these truths, that we don't even think like this typically. Most of us don't go through life spending a lot of time at this level of pondering and contemplation. Allah is the one who permits the truth to manifest itself. In other words, we are, Allah guides people to Islam. Sometimes you will hear da'is say, oh, I was the one that brought them to Islam. Well, you might have been an instrument presenting Allah to them, but only Allah calls people to the truth. Only Allah calls people to Islam. Allah is the one who permits the truth to manifest itself, who creates everything as Allah's wisdom dictates, who is present in a way which permits no room for Allah to be absent, nor different, nor extinct. So it's very hard to contemplate this because everything that we know in the material world for the most part has a lifespan. Stars have a lifespan. Some of them will die out. But imagine that Allah is this being that is always there, that never moves, that never changes. And the desire of the human being is always to be transformed, to move from nafs amara to nafs lawama to nafs mutma'ina, to move to a different state, a different hal, so that your heart is the home of Allah and Allah's truths, and that that which you operate from is the intelligence of the heart. Not that four-chamber heart that's in the middle or sort of to the left of our sternum. I believe that's correct, if I remember. That's what they told me was the truth anyway. What's the difference between the nafs, the three, the lawama, the Okay, very good. It's Arabic. Ex thank you. Yes. So, the nafs amara is an unconscious soul. So, it is really not aware. And I call this somnambulistic. I call this walking in your sleep or autopilot. So there are many people that that's what they do. They just do what they want to do. They wake up, they do the same things over and over and over again, never really thinking about whether it's constructive or destructive, and that's how they live their lives. So this is the unconscious soul. 
The nafsawama is a soul that has become aware of truth, and when it violates truth, it corrects and amends. So this is a different hal, it's a different maqam, it's a different station, it's a different state. Because now I am aware that I am trying to elevate my soul. Because after all, what is the most important part of yourself to develop? Your soul, because that's what's going to be returned to Allah. We spend a great deal of the time at the gym developing our physical bodies. How much time do we spend developing our soul? How well do you know your soul? Just something to ponder and reflect about. What is the station of your soul? Is it a soul that remembers Allah often? Or is it is a soul that hits and misses? And sometimes it doesn't fire. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh. Okay. Everything that exists is from Allah, and to Allah is its ultimate end. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so, nafs mutma'ina is the stage or state that all of us want to live in. And it is what I like to refer as the state of integrity. It is the state of peace. In other words, if I am always obeying the truth, how could I be conflicted? If every moment of my life I am making dhikr, I am remembering Allah and I am not there, I pray that I will be there, how would I ever be in conflict? So Nas Ma'ina is the soul that is at rest. And why is it at rest? Because it always obeys Allah. This is like a Ruhani creature and what I mean by that is, it is a creature that operates from the Ruh, from that which Allah breathed into your mother's womb. It is a soul that operates from the spirit. It approaches things with spirit. So for example, we talk a lot about this in the month of Rajab, Sha'aban and Ramadan. Preparing our soul. Pulling the weeds out of our soul. Watering the soul. And then letting the harvest come forth. So the Nasmud Ma'ina is a soul that has a great harvest, a great spiritual harvest. And we all want to be there, inshallah. And Allah does, over and over and over again, enjoin us towards transformation. He enjoins us to know our excitatory states, our whelms, our compulsions, our impulses, and to transform them into the attributes and characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we are doing this class and doing it in such an intensive manner. Hoping that you will go back and review and review and review and ask yourself, is this what I materialize? Is this what I manifest and realize in my world? al haq is the antithesis of falsehood. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, The Baka Hakan Hakka. That is, here I am, O truth. O truthful one, here I am. That is, here I am, the antithesis of falsehood. Surely Allah is the truth beyond any doubt. When we do our shahada, it is called what? A declaration of faith. When that shahada, when you have a conviction of that shahada, it becomes a kalima. So the shahada are words. And the Prophet Muhammad said that when we say it, it enters into our head. The akal. And as we practice and we realize and manifest Islam, peace, it moves into our heart. And when it moves into our heart, then we manifest and realize that truth. And we become beacons of light. We become influential people in our community. Why? 
not because of our ego, not because of our nafs, not because of our lower self, our egotistical desires, but because we are infused with the light, the enlightenment, the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when that truth is practiced, you will be an agent of change. You will change people's lives when you meet them. You will change the conditions of a place when you are called there and there is chaos. And it's really interesting because very often, for some reason, I am called to conflicting situations where husbands and wives are screaming and yelling. When we talk about what Allah has said and we talk about what does this do to your soul, in most cases, the whole energy is changed. Things are of three types, either an absolute falsehood or an absolute truth, or they may be like a coin. One face is truth and the other is falsehood. For this reason, Imam Ghazali said, everything someone tells is either absolute untrue or absolute true, or true on one hand and false on the other hand. What cannot be proven is the absolute falsehood, and what necessitates its own being is the absolute truth. What can be, but is also brought into being by another, is on one hand true and on another false. As far as its own essence, it does not have an existence of its own, so it is false. And on the other hand, others benefit from its existence, so it is causing or prolonging or contributing to the existence of something else which already exists. And in this case, it is true. For this reason, everything shall perish except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how Allah has always been and will always be. There is no change to Allah's condition simply because everything besides Allah which was brought to being in the ancient past or in the remote future may not be worthy of existing and hence it is false on its own merit, true by virtue of others or other or others. When we put this sort of in the perspective of life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he doesn't change the conditions of mankind except by their own soul. Interestingly enough, Isa alayhi salam, if this is truth, but it is written in the translations of the Bible, that he said, let him that stole steal no more. So he said, God isn't going to take it away from you. If you want to change, you will do it within yourself. And the older we get, they say the harder it is to change. I, I don't find that to be so true, but many people think that is a truth. They say it's a truth. Now you have come to know the absolute truth is the truly existing one who exists by its own self, the one through whom everything derives the truth relevant to it, it may also be said that something which agrees with reason and which is compatible with rationality is true. Allah, therefore, is the ever-present one. If or when Allah brings things into existence, Allah makes them a reality. And the knowledge that is most worthy of being known is the knowledge about Allah Almighty. Allah is the true on Allah's own merits. That is, the truth about Allah agrees with what is known since time immemorial and for the duration of eternity and due to Allah's compatibility only with Allah's own self rather than with anyone else and without the need to knowing someone else to compare Allah with. For the proof regarding Allah's existence will then hinge on that someone else which if gone, the proof will then be gone too. This theory may apply to what is spoken. One may call something true and something else false. 
Accordingly, the most true of everything uttered is to say, La ilaha illallah, there is no God except Allah, for it is always true and it stands on its own merits rather than being proven by something else. The haq, truth then, is applied to what can be seen by the eyes or envisioned by the mind as well as what can be said, articulated. The most worthy of all things of being the truth is the one whose presence is fixed by itself since time immemorial and forever the knowledge of whom was true in ancient time is true now and will remain true forever. And all of this testifies to the true existence of the truth rather than to anyone else. And when we think about how Allah never changes, He never stops forgiving, He never stops loving us, he never stops giving to us, no matter how we disappoint him. Everybody here today had some water or some coffee or some kind of fluids, I'm guessing, by the time you got here. Everybody here is breathing. Everybody here apparently has a pretty healthy blood pressure, even though it might fluctuate. The fact that you're here, more than likely it's pretty good. At least it's not high and you're stroking out on us. We change, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never changes. And his heart toward us does not change. As a matter of fact, it is said that we will meet him the way that we understand him or her, Allah. We need to have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you think from your aqal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this contemning heavy God that is ready to always rain down the storms of hell, fire, and brimstones on you, then that is how you will meet Allah. But I would challenge all of my students, based on what you learn about the asma wa safat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not what I see. Allah knows best. I see this loving and forgiving Allah that never ever leaves us alone. We leave him, we don't pray sometimes, we don't remember Allah, but he never leaves us. He is always true and always committed to us. Can we say the same? If we review the subject of truth in the text of the Holy Quran, in various verses we will find out that the book of Allah is true that the messenger has brought the truth, that the stories narrated by the Almighty recorded in it are true, that Allah created the heavens and the earth in truth, that Allah's statements are true, that Islam is the religion of truth, that Allah guides to the path of the truth, that Allah's promise is true, that Allah invites to the truth, that Allah's judgment is true, that Allah starts everything with the truth and judges with the truth. We as humans, imagine if we could adopt just this one slide. Because sometimes we start with the falsehood. We start and we tell a story and maybe we're exaggerating. Well, then is the story true? If I tell you I caught a fish and it was this long, but meanwhile it was this long and I had to throw it back because it was illegal for me to keep it, I've already started with the falsehood. How many times do we do that? We're not even honest with ourselves. In Surah Yunus, verse 82, Whereas by Allah's words, Allah proves the truth to be true. However hateful this may be to those who are lost in sin. So Allah promised that his Qur'an is a shafa, that the kalam of Allah is healing, and there are many people here that can testify to being healed by being from that. If not being healed from a physical ailment, perhaps from other ailments. Because there are many of us that once upon a time in our life we were suicidal. But by discovering the truth, our lives changed. And now we would not think about not wanting to live. 
And I testify to that myself. I struggled in years, preaching since I was nine. But after I found Islam, I had a whole different hal. There was a peace inside of me and my wife observed me become a Muslim. And although I wasn't a bad dude, she saw a shift in my hal, in my state. And she said that shift spoke to her in a very loud way. And if you are enmeshed in the truth, it will change your life. Surah Luqman, verse 33, O people, be conscious of your sustainer and stand in all on the day on which no parent will be of any avail to his child or her child, nor a child will be in the least avail his or her parents. Verily Allah's promise of resurrection is true indeed. Let not then the life of this world delude you and let not your own deceptive thoughts about Allah delude you. And this is really amazing because a lot of people will do the I think religion. Well, you know, I think God is this. You, how many people have heard this conversation? And people actually have the religion of I think. And whatever they think is their truth. And they are absolutely convicted about their self-created religion and their ideas about God, which they have not heard from him or her. Everything whose presence is possible becomes present only by virtue of the power of its creator. The one who is present by necessity is the same one who renders the presence, the existence of everything and everyone else besides Allah, a reality. This is the meaning of Surah 10 verse 82 which we read before. All glory to Allah is the truth on Allah's own merits. Through Allah's words, Allah manifests the truth. So what a beautiful application of these Quranic verses in our world. Since it has been proven that the glorified one necessitates Allah's existence by Allah's own merits, the belief in Allah's existence and the belief in Allah's being described by all the great names of exaltation and greatness is the most truthful of all beliefs. This is so due to the fact that since Allah suffers no alteration whatsoever, the belief in Allah necessitates that it too suffers no alteration. And this is amazing because of Allah's mercy we learn in authentic ahadith that our iman fluctuates 40 times in a day. I might wake up in the morning, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, another great day. And then by the afternoon, when a few things might have not gone the way my nafs wanted them to go, I'm complaining. And, uh, yeah, astaghfirullah. We fluctuate, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never fluctuates. Imagine getting to a place in our iman where we didn't fluctuate so much. This is so due to the fact that since Allah suffers no alteration whatsoever, the belief in Allah necessitates that it too suffers no alteration. And the opposite will be to reverse truth into falsehood. So if I have this understanding of truth, and I dangerously start saying what I think in my akal, then I will actually reverse that truth which I've been enlightened with to falsehood. And that's why I warn all reverts. When people start telling you astaghfirullah adhim, tell me where it says that in the Quran. Can you show me what you're trying to tell me? And if they can't give you proof, run like hell. Because they're not a teacher that you want. If a teacher cannot give you the proofs, then they're not a teacher. They may just be telling you what they think. 
And this is not only for reverts, but specifically because reverts are in a new learning curve, it's very dangerous for them to take what everybody at the masjid says. If I had taken everything I was told the first week I was a Muslim, I would not be standing here today. Because I was, every single thing I'd done, I was told haram. As a matter of fact, I learned more what was haram than what was halal. And I started saying to people, for God's sake, will you just tell me what's halal and stop telling me what's haram? And then I'll know what to do. Because right now I don't have a lot of knowledge. But they were real good at telling me how haram I was. I thought of changing my name from Abdurak man to haram. <laughs> because that seemed to be more fitting based on the feedback I was getting. It's also for people that were born into the faith or raised in a certain culture to separate the culture from Islam. That's huge. And we try very hard to do that in Islam. As a matter of fact, the feedback that we get is in the class, there's no culture. Well, I have a hard time believing that it doesn't slip in here and there, but our, we endeavor to separate culture. As a matter of fact, uh, the wedding that I did yesterday, some people came to me and said, well, I didn't understand this or this and this. And I said, because those were simply cultural activities. They had nothing to do with the Quran or the Sunnah. What you heard me say, I gave the proofs. What you saw them do, they did not give the proofs. So this is exactly how I told the people. They were guests. There were many non-Muslims there that for the first time saw a Muslim wedding and interwoven into the truth was all this cultural stuff that really has nothing to do whatsoever with Islam or even the precepts of Islam. I did cover all of this, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> Thus, in the case of admitting Allah is truth, and the testimony regarding Allah's existence, all glory to Allah, is the most worthy of any truth of being conceived as the very absolute pure truth. Knowing Allah is the most worthy of all knowledge of the truth, admitting the belief in Allah is the most truthful of anything uttered. The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the salvation of your soul. And without it, your soul will not wander in enlightenment and in light, but it will wander in confusion and darkness. And there will be a veil between you and Allah. And you will be deluded. We ask Allah in our dua, Allah remove the veil. Are we talking about the veil that's here? No. We're not saying Allah remove the veil of what I see physically and what I hear in the physical realm, we're saying Allah remove the veil so that the eyes and the ears of my heart can see. And I can see clearly the spiritual things of this world. Interestingly enough, what is translated, whether it's truth or not, I do not know. Isa alayhi salam said, The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit, for they are foolishness to him. So we ask Allah, open our hearts, our ears, and our eyes to see the things from the Ruh, the things from Allah, the truth, and not falsehood. Protect us, O Allah, from falsehood. Imam Ghazali said, a servant of Allah ought to see no truth besides Allah. For if, Allah, if a servant of Allah is existing, he or she exists, I keep getting these pop-ups, because Allah preserves him or her, not because he or she preserves his or her own self. And may Allah forgive me, I'm not remembering the battle where the Prophet ﷺ threw the sand, and he said it was not I who threw the sand. As Muslims we say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There is no power or might except by Allah. And we really, if we manifest and realize that, we know that in and of ourselves we can do nothing. That anything that we achieve, we only achieve it through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
If Allah willed, we will not achieve that thing. When a servant of Allah is when a servant of Allah is right, he or she is not right on his or her own merit. Rather, Allah has helped him or her manifest his or her truth. Had Allah the truth not permitted him or her to exist, he or she would not have been a reality, but a falsehood. We talk about things in the world being figments of our imagination. If Allah had not willed us to be here, we would not be here. And what's amazing is that in the Qadr of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew today, every one of you would be here. And we would be together. For Allah's sake. Some scholars have said that the lot of the servant of Allah who wishes to personify the great name of Allah al-Haq in his or her conduct is that hearts are like containers which, when full of the truth, will overflow with light on the senses. So that the light from inside, the intrinsic light of Allah, will spill out and affect the extremities of our body. And this is really what we are striving to do, is that our heart would be in such a state, our heart would be in such a condition that our extremities would obey the heart. And what is the heart fed by? It's fed by the Quran and the Sunnah. That is the intellect of the heart. If the heart does not have that intellect, it will be misled and it will be dark and it will each day accumulate more dust and dirt until the point that it will not be able to see. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if we continue to bring darkness upon ourselves, we can be blinded. He's not talking about these eyes. He's talking about the eyes of the heart. Whenever the Prophet Wasallam used to make tahajjud during the night, he would say, Lord, all praise is due to you. You are the Lord of the heavens and the earth and everything in them. All praise is due to you. You are the one who sustains the heavens and the earth and everything in them. You are the truth. Your speech is the truth. Your promise is the truth. Meeting with you is the truth. Paradise is the truth. Hell is the truth. The hour of judgment is the truth. Lord, to you have I submitted myself. In you I believed. Upon you have I relied. To you have I returned. For your sake I disputed with others based upon your truth. Have I arbitrated. So I implore you to forgive my past faults and my future ones. What I have concealed and what I have manifested. You are my Lord. There is no God but you. al haq means the supreme being whose existence is intrinsically necessary and for whom termination, non-existence, and change are impossible. All the all are from the divine and to the divine everything other than the divine is naught. Batil in Arabic. For all else besides the divine entity is without ultimate reality. Not one of us knows what's going to happen when we leave here today. And the younger we are, we think we are invincible. We think that we can drive our cars 120 miles an hour on I-4 and nothing will happen. We can jump out of planes and there's no risk because our amygdala isn't developed. <laughs> so, and all of us know about this and that's why we're laughing. We remember the days when there was no frontal lobe and there was no judgment and we couldn't understand what our parents were saying because God hadn't equipped us to. And that's why it's so important that if your parents are on the truth, you can trust them. If your parents, imagine if your parents, if you develop yourself to manifest just the attribute that we talk today, what kind of relationship we would have with our children? And what kind of relationship they would have with us? 
how secure they would be and how much they could trust. This is alluded to in the Hadith, the most truthful statement said by a poet is the statement of Labid. Lo, everything besides Allah is naught. It is a temporary thing created by Allah. Al-Haq means the possessor of truth, meaning the one who manifested. It is also said to mean the truthful and the just. Some scholars have said that Al-Haq is an absolute name. Ism means name in Arabic. Ism mutlaq. And the manifest Al-Zahir, the existent, the guide to Allah's inward realities. When applied as a description for others, the name Haq refers to one who does good deeds and who is sound in his or her beliefs and work works. Thus it is said such and such action and statement and belief is haq. It is a characteristic of the folk, the Sufis in this context I will say, that they use the name al-haq and they speak of the divine, exalted is Allah. Because the real is the supreme being whose existence is intrinsically necessary. And if you think about this, if you ponder at a deeper level, where did we come from? We came from heaven. We came from the unseen world. The world of the souls. Allah pulled out a soul and he breathed it into your mother's womb. Something of the unseen being that always strives, inshallah, to go back home. The reason for this is that the folk, and I'm speaking in this context of Sufis, after having ascended from the station of witnessing the divine actions to witnessing the divine attributes. So all of us come out of the womb witnessing the divine actions. We see the creation of Allah and we are enamored as kids by the creation of Allah and even as adults. But kids, I love to watch kids discovering the creation of Allah. But we are to be witnessing the divine attributes. We are to be emulating the divine attributes. We are to be knowing them, witnessing them, seeing them in other people around us that call themselves Muslims, the doers of peace, or mu'min, even a higher level, the one whom you can entrust your life and property. This is besides, other than Allah, has no independent being. Real being is naught but Allah Most High. Allah is the absolute real. The folks use the name Al-Haq similar to the scholars in the station of rational demonstration and proof who characteristically tend to use the name Al-Bari, which means the creator, when they speak of the divine, because they see nothing but creation and it is from creation that they infer the creator's existence, expressing the extent of of their understanding. He or she who knows that Allah is the real will forget creation as he or she invokes Allah and will prefer truthfulness over all else. And through gatheredness, I made up that word, <laughs> because the scholars say, and this is from Hadith, that if we do not sit at the feet of a scholar within three days, our heart begins to die. We need to be together. And I pray that somehow by the grace of God, one day we will be together more than one time a week. Because our hearts need this. We need the support. 
we need to witness the attributes of Allah and be with people that are materializing and manifesting them so that we can. So through the jama'ah, he or she will be absent from separation through anna annihilation, not longing. We should connect with this name by turning resolutely to Allah, asking Allah to fulfill our hopes in Allah, asking Allah to utilize us in truth within all matters, upholding the rights of lordship and fulfilling the conduct that befits servitude. All of us are the servants of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created men and jinns for naught except that they serve Him, that they worship Allah. And this is one of the ways that we worship Allah is to manifest His attributes to the world. And my, how the world needs hope today. And how everyone will come to Islam when we realize these attributes. Everybody will want this. But unfortunately, because people come to Islam and they find no adabs in many of the masajid, may Allah help us, manners, they run away because we aren't witnessing these attributes and we don't know them. May Allah help us not to be among those people. We should connect with this name by turning resolutely, resolving to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah to fulfill our hopes in Allah, asking Allah to utilize us in truth within all matters. And I read that. We should cultivate this name in our character by verifying that our spiritual states are free of pretentious claims. And let me say this, that in the latter days, the Prophet Muhammad said that people will value their opinions. They will worship their opinions. And our opinions are really nothing and they certainly are not truth. But today you will see people argue, or at least in my lifetime, I see that people worship their opinions. They are willing to fight. They are willing to defend people because of their opinions. And this is, we were warned about this from the Prophet ﷺ. May our opinions be the opinions of Haq. May our opinions, may what we say come from Quran and Sunnah. And if not directly from the Quran and the Sunnah, a manifestation of behavior that comes from our knowledge of that. We should purify our statements from lies and biases. We will realize this name when we are unmitigated when we are unmitigated truth and Allah hurls us against every falsehood pulverizing it with our reality and spiritual ambition and lastly some great reflections from the 99 names of God by Daniel Thomas Dyer signs of Hawk the verses in the Quran are called ayat which means signs. The Quran is a book of signs that leads us to the truth. However, there are different interpretations of the Quran. Some of them are wrong and can misguide us. So which interpretation can we trust? Muhammad Wasallam said, Sin is whatever troubles your heart. So if an interpretation seems mean, cruel, or intolerant, and does not feel right in your heart, it is a good sign that it is not true. For example, Muslims, the mu in front of a verb turns the verb into a noun. Salam means peace. If I am the doer of peace, how can I have a bomb strapped on my belt? If I'm the doer of peace, how can I say something hurtful to you? If I am truly the doer of peace. 
So we are not a religion that is cruel and hurtful. We are a religion that says no one truly believes until they love. We are a religion of love. We are a religion of forgiveness. Rumi tells us the interpretation of a sacred text is true if it stirs us to hope, activity, and all. How many of us are stirred to activity and all when we read the Kalam of Allah? And if we are stirred to think of negativity, then perhaps there's something wrong with our spiritual vision. Perhaps we are listening to Fox and CNN instead of the Kalam of Allah. And this is, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to be careful what you listen to with these ears because the heart is affected by what you bring inside yourself through these physical ears. Let your ears be the ears of your spiritual heart, the ears that are highly sensitive to what Allah and His Messenger has said. A true interpretation will make us feel positive and humble. And the Quran talks about those that when they read the Kalam of Allah, they are shaken, they cry. It moves their heart. Al-Haq means the truth. Allah tells the truth, loves those who speak the truth, and is the truth. When Allah speaks, all that is false disappears. So we can also say that Al-Haq is the real. Who do we trust? And this is a time of reflection and in a moment we'll open up for discussion, inshallah. And if you must leave, I understand. We might think that what we hear on the news is the truth. Unfortunately, this is often not the case and we need to be very careful about what we believe. The internet and TV bombard us with information, but much of it is designed to distract us from the truth, and we should be wary of it. As a matter of fact, one of the largest fields and growing fields of psychology is impulse psychology. And this is why when you go to Target, I'm not doing a plug for anybody, or you go to TJ Maxx, you can tell I don't shop a lot. Ross and Marshalls, they have this long line before you get to the register to catch your impulses and your whelms. And I'm not going to ask how many have ever bought anything while waiting in line. We also need to be honest with ourselves. It is easy for us to fall into delusion if it makes us feel better. See, sometimes when we lie to ourselves, it makes us feel better, but it's a total delusion. I'm not angry, but meanwhile you can hear them that they're angry. They're deluded. They don't even know they're angry, but they're screaming, and everybody else knows they're angry. Call denial for a reason. We also need to be honest with ourselves. It is easy for us to fall into delusions if it makes us feel better. No matter how much I can call something crooked straight, it won't change it. Sometimes we try to convince ourselves that something is true when it isn't. Sometimes the person lying to us is ourselves and we need to be very brave to face the truth. They say the truth hurts and the truth about ourself is very painful. But when you spend the time to find out that truth, there's gain in the pain. And here are our reflections. So I'll turn the mic off so you don't have to be afraid of the mic.